All right, so we are going to work our way through Exploration 5.8a, which is Applications of Definite Integrals. And the objective here is that you start to really see a connection or an, an interpretation of f of x dx. So you should already have the paper in front of you with the same picture that you're looking at on screen here. So it says, number one, on the graph, pick a sample point t, which I have shown here. You can put it wherever you'd like it to be and then show the corresponding point on the graph, and that's where this red dot is near the top uh, of the graph in between, right around x equals 70. Uh, we're going to draw a narrow vertical strip, and that narrow vertical strip is going to create something that's approximately a rectangular shape, something kind of like that. And notice my point t comma v of t is within that strip, the width of that strip we're going to call dt, okay? Um, now, if you think about it, the velocity throughout this little vertical strip doesn't really change all that much. Uh, it's not that different from the left side of the strip to the right side of the strip, and certainly we would say that from the point that's sort of in the middle to either end, there isn't that much difference. So we could almost think of this as a rectangle. And when you're thinking about question number three in this particular problem, because it asks you, you know, why the distance that's been traveled in this time interval is approximately equal to v of t times dt, well, if we think of the shape that we just drew as a rectangle, the base of the rectangle is visibly dt, and v of t is a pretty good approximation for the height of that particular rectangle, so it's reasonable to assume the distance, which would be the area of the rectangle, is equal to the product of those two things. Now I'm going to clear this out, and we're going to create a Riemann sum that represents the total distance the spaceship goes between 0 and 100. And I just want to uh, let you know we're also going to calculate a sample Riemann sum, but just in general, here's what it would look like. The Riemann sum would be, obviously, the sum for n uh, intervals here, so for i equals 1 to n, meaning we're going to have n little rectangles, and those rectangles are going to be made up, just like the one we just drew, of some v value for, say, a group of c constants, there's going to be uh, n of those, times dt, and we're going to assume that dt is going to stay the same, those little widths are going to stay the same all the way through. If you were to calculate this as a sample, so I did it, for example, for, um, I believe I did about 50 increments, and I did the, um, the midpoint sum just as a sample value using my Riemann program. I ended up with something in the neighborhood of 772,650.273, and those, that would be measured in feet. So you might pause the video for just a minute and use your Riemann program and um, enter the equation for this and just run a sample just to see that you get a number that's in the same ballpark. Okay, so that, we're up to about number four at this point. If we look at number five, it says explain why the Riemann sum that we just wrote is between the lower sum and the upper sum. Well, remember that the upper sum would be rectangles that are all a little taller than the function, so the sum that's the, considered the upper sum would definitely be bigger than the Riemann sum, and that the lower sum would use a bunch of rectangles that are all a little shorter than the graph itself, so that would definitely be less than, than the Riemann sum. So our Riemann sum is kind of sandwiched in between the lower sum and the upper sum, and if we allow n to go to infinity, so we take the limit of all of these sums as n approaches infinity, what we're going to find out is that uh, from the definition of the definite integral, that all of these values are basically going to not, not only approach each other, but they're definitely going to approach the value of the definite integral. If this seems a little bit familiar from that definition that you memorized for the first semester final, it should. So we're eventually going to get the definite integral from 0 to 100 of v of t dt. Okay, so that addresses the issues in number 5. Let's take a look at number 6. This is where we actually get into using our definite integral a little bit more. So we're going to evaluate the integral uh, using the fundamental theorem. So this is kind of more like what we were doing earlier. 
So here is the integral from 0 to 100 of 3,000 plus 18t to the 1.4. Uh, when we evaluate that integral, what we're going to get is 3,000t plus 18 divided by 2.4 times t to the 2.4, evaluated at 0 and at oops, 100, excuse me. Okay. And I'll let you go ahead and plug those values in. Uh, my value that I get here, if you want to pause the video and do that, you can. I'm just going to uh, go directly to the answer here, which is this kind of large number. And you might notice this is right in the same ballpark as the number that I got from my Riemann program, hopefully the same type of number that you got from yours. So this is telling me the distance traveled by the spaceship using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And when we're talking about a spaceship, that's not un unusual. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, if you were to divide this by 5,280, it turns out to be approximately 146 miles. And again, that would be a very reasonable distance for a spaceship to have traveled. All right, so in number seven, it says in order to orbit, the spaceship must be going at least 26,000 feet per second and it says to the nearest second, at what time is it going that fast? Well, that's, I believe, not a time that actually appears on our graph. So we're going to have to solve for this algebraically, which might not have jumped into your head as you're, as you're thinking about this as to what to do. So we're going to take 26,000 equal to 3,000 plus 18t to the 1.4. And we're going to subtract our 3,000 from both sides. And then we're going to divide by 18, once we get this part down. And we get t to the 1.4 equals uh, approximately 1,277, and then a whole bunch of 7s after that. And it may not be totally obvious to you how to solve this for t. One of the things that you can do is you could take the number that's currently sitting in your calculator screen, the 12, 77, and all the rest of the sevens, and you can raise that to the reciprocal of the power that you have, the 1.4 that's here. Um, if this was t squared, we could essentially raise everything to the 1 half power. So that's kind of what we're going to do here. We're going to raise this to the 1 over 1.4 power, excuse me, and what that's going to do is it's going to take the appropriate root. When we do that, we're going to get that t is approximately 166 seconds. And it asks for this at rounded to the nearest second. Um, that doesn't show up on our graph. That's beyond our graph that we had initially had to start the problem. So you might want to just note that. Now, number eight says that we're supposed to say, how far does the spaceship go from the time the last stage fires, which, by the way, was time zero, to the time it reaches its orbital velocity? The way this question is phrased, they're having, making you think in context about what times those are. That's from zero, if you go back and reread the uh, directions at the beginning, you'll see that, to 166, which is the answer that you just found. But you've got to think about that in context. So we're going to evaluate the same integral from 0 to 166 of v of t dt. You already calculated this integral in number 6, so you kind of have the framework. All you really have to do is plug in 166 instead of plugging in 100 like we did before in 0, which doesn't do anything. So if you plug in 166 to the integral that you already calculated, you're going to get this. 2,095,057.949 feet. If you convert that to miles, it turns out to be just shy of 400 miles. So uh, you might uh, verify that calculation. You certainly can pause the video and do that. So number nine is kind of where the rubber meets the road. This is based on what you observed. Why do you suppose integrals are written in what we call differential form? Well, remember that what we decided was this f of x dx, or the integral of f of x dx, basically really shows us that each part of this has a physical meaning. The f of x is sort of like the height of the rectangle that we're using in the Riemann sum, and the dx represented the base. 
of the rectangle that we're using in the Riemann sum. And so when you multiply those two together, you're getting that series of rectangles, and then we're taking that limit as those rectangles get skinnier and skinnier. So because each of these has a physical meaning, this is usually why we're going to express the integrals in this particular way.